started Hi. in just a minute. Hi. <laughs> we'll get started in just a minute or so. We're just letting people in from the waiting room. Um, everyone tends to join right at, you know, 12, 15. So please bear with us as we sort of let folks in. Um, you'll be seeing me first. My name is Vanessa Oliver. I'll introduce myself again to you, but um, my name is Vanessa and I'm one of the dietitians with the UK Health and Wellness Program. Uh, and I will be joined today by Chef Tanya Whitehouse, otherwise known as Chef T from Food Connection Kitchen. Um, so we're, we're excited to, to be with you all today. We are recording this, so if you need to step away for any reason, uh, we'll be sending out the recording of this demo uh, shortly after we finish, sometime this afternoon, once it gets all loaded and processed. Um, if you register for this event, you will receive not only the recording of the demo, but you'll also receive the recipes that we're going to prepare for you today. We have at least four recipes, maybe five, so we are going to be blazing through it. Um, we also made a little resource for you, um, kind of like what to stock if you're building your pantry. All right, so, um, so we still have some folks joining, so I'm just going to give it another minute. If anyone has any questions or things that they'd like us to address, please put that in the chat, and we can monitor that as we go. Um, so we'll try to address anything that you've got cooking or not cooking, as the case may be. We're up to, it looks like, 47 people. That's great. Awesome. Anyone have any questions right now? If you do, you can go on and put them in the chat. I'll give you another minute or so. Folks to join. Since we are recording, we'll ask that you keep your microphones off just to cut down on any barking dogs or screaming children that might be in the background. No questions yet, it looks like, which is totally fine. If you haven't been in the Food Connection space, um, it's located on Central Campus in the building known as the 90. Um, it's across from W.T. Young or Willie T. Library and Chef T and the Food Connection staff always have such wonderful speakers and events. They brought back the first Friday events this semester. They just had a really successful one um, this past two Fridays ago. Mm -hmm. um, that was really wonderful. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, Food Connection Kitchen and its events, you can uh, follow them on social media. They're active on Facebook and Instagram. And their handle is at UK Food Connect. At UK Food Connect. So be sure to check them out and you'll be able to learn about all of the great programs that they are bringing to campus for employees and for uh, the community as well. Our counter video is very important. Right? Yeah. Well, Thank you for letting us know. Yeah. yeah, we might have to tweak that just a little bit. So thank you. 52 people. Keep going in just another minute. Any other questions or comments? Let us know. And try to fix that counter camera for you all. So the image may go away briefly. I think it's also the size. If you if you have uh, your zoom set on speaker view, then the counter may be the really enlarged on your screen. So <laughs> that might be, it kind of pixelates uh, when I have it on speaker view, but it's, um, oh, yeah. yeah, see? You can see what I'm doing on our other camera, but yeah, wait, if you have it on speaker view, that may be the issue. So you may want to put it on um, 
the other view, the gallery view. So if you didn't hear that, if you are feeling that one of the images, one of the camera views is a bit grainy, then you may want to switch your zoom settings from speaker view to gallery view and see if that helps at all. Well, it's 1220. Yep. I should probably get cooking. All right. So, hello and welcome again. My name is Vanessa Oliver, and I'm one of the dietitians with the UK HR Health and Wellness Program. And I'm teamed up today with Chef Tanya Whitehouse from the Food Connection Kitchen. And we'll be bringing at least four recipes to you from our pantries. Um, we chose this theme for our cooking demo today um, because we, as a, in my job, certainly as a consulting dietitian um, for UK employees, retirees, and their spouses, um, I hear a lot from people who are just, they kind of want to cook more, but they're really unsure of where to start, and they feel like it can be quite overwhelming. Um, so what we thought we would do is come together to build a little pantry resource list for you all, both sort of basic kitchen, and then maybe with a little bit of fancier items um, that aren't necessary, but you may want to include if you want to zhuzh up that pantry a little bit. So we will be sending you that pantry resource list along with the recording of this demo and the recipes that we're going to prepare for you today. Um, I will say, Tanya, one thing that occurred to me as far as if someone is building their pantry, maybe they have some things in the pantry or, um, have or, or where to go with that. One of the first things they can really do is look to see what's in there, right? Because some, um, if it's been a while since you really looked to see um, what, what you got going on. So the first step I feel like is, is really inventory. taking a little inventory. <laughs> yeah. Taking a little inventory and whether or not, you have photographs that go along with that inventory or you just make a list or you have a checklist that can really help you when you're starting to build and then when you are starting to bring new ingredients in um, there is a little principle that we like to call first in first out right sometimes you'll see that capitalized f-i-f-o and basically what that means is you're going to use the oldest stuff first you're going to put the newest stuff in the back and then that way you have a constant rotation of ingredients that are kind of honoring their, their shelf life and their usefulness. Everyone's going to have different categories of usefulness in their pantry. We've done our best to just sort of come up with a general idea of a resource for you all. Um, yep. First in, first, first in, out. First out. Yep, exactly right. Okay, so the two recipes that I'm going to be preparing for you all today are incredibly basic. They really are just pulling from the pantry. You would be able to add fresh produce to these um, as the seasons progress. Um, right now, the curried lentil soup that I'm going to prepare for you is a very basic recipe. There's not a lot of vegetables in there, but it would be really easy to add things like carrots or celery or sweet potatoes or other colored potatoes like gold or blue and all of these are coming into harvest um, right now locally so as i go along with preparing this recipe if you're thinking of some vegetables that you might like to add go on and drop this in the chat and maybe you'll be able to give some of your fellow participants some idea um, but what i'm going to do is i'm going to go on and get started right now i'm just going to turn my burner on here So I've got just a little bit of oil heating up um, in a saucepan, and I'm going to go on and dice up a little bit of onion. Um, these onions are from Stonehenge Farm, which is a local farm in Woodford County, I believe. Adrian's in Woodford. Adrian, yep. You can find her at the farmer's market, kind of toward the main street side. So I just diced up that onion pretty quickly. And I'm just going to add it to a pot and let it get sauteing. Um, I really like to do a lentil soup um, 
because first of all, lentils are pretty inexpensive. Um, they, we do have a vegetarian household, but they also have kind of a, a meaty sort of texture and flavor. So if you are new to plant-based cooking and you wanna experiment a little bit with beans and lentils, um, lentils are kind of a, a low stress, kind of low stakes way to get into cooking from dried beans because they take a lot less time to cook than something like a dry pinto bean or a dry kidney bean. Also, if anyone here has historically found a little bit of difficulty with maybe digesting beans in the past, um, lentils tend to be a little bit more easily digestible than um, some of the other beans that might be out there, like black beans or garbanzo beans, um, et cetera. And they're called lentil, just to get a little bit word dirty on you since I was an English major in my past life. Um, they're called lentil because it looks like a little lens, the lens shape. And the Latin root for lentil comes from the Latin word for lens. So there you go. Yeah, a little bit of, little bit of knowledge to drop on you there. Um, like I said, dried lentils are incredibly inexpensive. You can find them pretty much anywhere. If you want to make this soup even easier, you could also find a steamed lentil or already cooked lentil at your local grocery store. I find these at Trader Joe's. You can also find a canned version at many other groceries like Meyer or Walmart. They might be in the international aisle, so that's something that you might want to check out too. You pay a little bit more for the convenience, but again, you're just taking out a step of, um, of having to cook some lentils. So let's see. We do have a question about a substitution for onion. Yeah, so if someone has an onion allergy, right? So onions are known as an aromatic. They, once you cut them, they release flavor into whatever you're cooking, right? So if you're not able to tolerate onions or garlic for various reasons, you can certainly leave them out, okay? Um, some people who are not able to tolerate onions are able to tolerate things like chive tops or scallion tops. And so one technique is to saute those in the oil and then take them out of what you're cooking. And so that might be something to, um, to do another technique, although you might have to go to a special grocery store, is to use a, an Indian spice, actually we were just talking about this before our demo, called Ajwan, and it's spelled A-J-W-A-I-N. It's often used in Indian and South Asian cooking, and it's used to help with the digestibility of beans and lentils. It also has a very sort of slight onion-ish flavor. So those would be some, some options that I would think about um, if I were not able to use onions. Or you can simply leave them out and use other aromatics like carrot or celery or ginger. So I've just added some garlic to my onions. And I usually, whenever I'm sauteing anything, I do the onions first because the garlic cooks so quickly, okay? I'm also gonna add some spices. I'm gonna add a little bit of curry powder. We have another lentil fan who likes uh, the uh, Trader Joe's steamed lentils for salads. For salads, they're great. I don't know what they put in these Trader Joe's steamed lentils because all it does is say lentils and the sodium level is not very high either, which is unusual for a prepared food like that. Um, but they're delicious. They are worth it to me um, to, to buy and spend a little bit extra. So I've added some curry powder and some garlic and some salt and pepper. I'm going to add just a little bit of chili flake because I like things a little bit spicy. And I'm going to go on and add some um, diced tomato to my soup here. And when you do that, it will start to scatter a little bit because you've had that pan on for a little bit longer. So you can go on and add a little bit of water too to thin it out. And then I'm using coconut milk. For this curry lentil. Um, whenever you are looking for coconut milk, you want to make sure that you are actually finding coconut milk, not coconut cream, which is a lot thicker, 
or Coco Loco, which is for something completely different. Um, so you're going to want to look for coconut milk. Whether or not you choose reduced fat is really up to you. Some of the reduced fat ones will have um, thickening agents in them that you may or may not want. So just be sure to check out your ingredient list. Um, but the recipe that I'm making today calls for one can of coconut milk. Um, if you are near an Asian grocery, then you can find little tetra packs of coconut milk that usually come in, I believe it's a six ounce measurement. So that's another version um, or another option for you if you are looking to get some coconut milk in your pantry and maybe think that you might be using it in a smaller quantity. So I'm going to go on and add my lentils. And this recipe takes about a cup of lentils. And then what you would do is let that come to a boil. And that boiling action will help initiate the cooking process of lentils. Um, but whereas some dry beans will take as long as two, three, four hours to get to that eating consistency, dry lentils are pretty much done in about 30 or 35 minutes. So you're able to truly cook from your pantry and have a soup that's going to be done in about 30 or 35 minutes. Okay. Once it comes up to a boil, which it's almost doing, then I'm going to turn it down to a simmer and just cook until the lentils reach that desired consistency. Um, some kinds of lentils will fall apart quite a lot when you are making a soup. Some that will be like the pink lentils or the yellow lentils, which are actually a split pea um, that you might see in stores. But other lentils will not fall apart, such as a black lentil or a green lentil. These are kind of somewhere in the middle. Okay, these are sometimes, um, these are called a green or a brown lentil, and these will maintain a little bit of texture while still becoming soft enough to eat in the soup. So it's kind of your, your basic starter lentil. Um, so it is just about coming to a boil. I'm going to give it a little bit of a stir. About how much liquid total have you added for that cup of lentils? So for lentils, when you're cooking them, it really depends on what your consistency, your desired finished consistency is going to be. For this particular recipe, for a cup of lentils, you're adding about two and a half cups of water, you're adding a full 14 ounce can of coconut milk, and then you're also adding a 28 ounce can of tomatoes. So that's, you know, quite a bit, six cups or so of, of liquid. Yeah. So you can see that those lentils are really going to soak up all of that liquid, but what they're doing is also soaking up all of that flavor. So when you're making soup like this with lentils or other beans, not only are they going to soak up the flavor from all those flavoring agents, but they're also going to soak up some salt. So be sure to salt a little bit as you go along, and then that way you'll be able to build some flavors too. Um, oh, and the person who asked has undercooked lentils, which you're right, is not super fun, but it's usually pretty fixable. Yes. You know, I mean, if you feel like your lentils are undercooked, add some more liquid and then just go on and keep cooking. You might want to also cook with a lid on top of the pot because that will keep the liquid from evaporating so quickly. So if you're busy doing other stuff, then that might be something to try as well. Or if you're in a hurry, use a smaller lentil rather than the large group brown ones. Yeah. So the, the tiny French lentils uh, cook a little faster. And then of course, uh, if you're looking at a doll or even something like this, I think even this tiny red lentils would would work really well. Yeah, so and I want to show you all too. So right now you can see it's very liquidy. Each sort of piece of the soup here is very discreet, right? It's very separate. But because of the magic of television, um, we have some here that is already pretty much done, okay? And you can see how the lentils have swelled up um, they've taken on a lot of flavor and their texture has changed. So this to me is a good texture for lentil soup, especially when it's a little bit chilly out like it was this morning. If you feel like this is not the texture that you're looking for, the recipe is super forgiving. It just tells you to add more water. Of course, you could add other things like vegetable stock or chicken stock, which would bring a little bit of flavor. You could add a little bit more coconut milk or you could also add a little bit more tomato. 
as well. Okay, so this, as I said, is just about done. What I'm going to do is chop up a little bit of cilantro. And when you're using cilantro, you can use the stems also. They have a lot of flavor. I don't always recommend that with all herbs, but with cilantro, I, I do. Um, it gives you a little bit of different texture too because you get that crunch and you um, are also gonna get the flavor too. So um, it's up to you whether or not you do it, but um, I'm gonna add a little bit of cilantro here. We have a question about non-dairy milks mm -hmm. and regarding the fact that they state to use within seven days. Is that because of taste or safety? Um, you may have thoughts about this, but so the question about if it's for taste or safety really kind of depends on the product, right? Um, it could be both. Generally speaking, when you open something and you keep it in the fridge, if it's a leftover, you know, it could go, there's such a span, right? Maybe three days, maybe four days, but I really wouldn't keep something more than seven days open in the refrigerator. If you feel like you have difficulty using something like an alternative milk in seven days, you can always freeze the leftover and then defrost it as you need it. What do you think? Yeah, throw it in some ice cubes and yeah. then freeze it. You can toss it in a bag and that way you can use it in small portions if you need to. Yeah, exactly. So um, so here we have our finished sort of lentil soup here. Again, this is completely plant-based um, and vegan um, if that is important to you. Lentils are a great source of protein, iron, selenium, fiber, Maybe some other things that I'm forgetting right now, but um, you know, if you've been curious about lentils, again, this is a low stakes, low risk. You saw, honestly, it only needs to cook for another 20 minutes or so, and then you're gonna get something that does stay good in the refrigerator for about four or five days and also freezes really, really well. So this is something to keep in your toolbox for sure. So if you have any other questions like that, all right, looking good. So I'm gonna go into my second recipe, which is called Eggs in Purgatory. Um, so it's kind of a scary name, maybe good for Halloween, I don't know. So I read a little bit, Tanya, about where that name comes from. What have you heard? Um, mostly the MFK Fisher in that, you know, well, she, she calls them something else, but we won't mention that. Yeah, we're gonna um, keep it clean. <laughs> gonna keep it clean. Um, but basically from, it's almost like the term deviled, you know, they're a little bit spicy. So, uh, and we were talking about, you know, foods that might warm you according to certain cultural traditions. So, uh, these, these might be, uh, reminiscent of, uh, the afterlife that we're afraid of. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of what I've heard too. Um, it can get, it gets a little bit biblical, a little bit, yeah, kind of. Um, but the, the purgatory that the title of the recipe refers to can refer to the spice that we're going to add to the sauce. It might just refer to the red color of the sauce as well. So we'll see how that goes. You can really control the spice level of this according to your preference, of course. You don't have to make it spicy at all if you don't want to. Um, but what I'm gonna do is go on and saute. Again, I'm starting with onions in oil. I'm doing this in a small skillet. Um, with the serving size for eggs in purgatory, it really depends on how many eggs you wanna eat. Okay, so if you wanna eat one to two eggs per person, is generally what the serving would be. So you would size your pan accordingly, okay? And this is something that I make for dinner a lot, all right? So if you've not thought about eggs for dinner before, um, again, it's an easily stored, inexpensive protein source that can just be a, a very quick meal to put together and maybe have a little bit of salad or a little bit of bread. Um, a very similar recipe is called shakshuka, which is Basically the same eggs cooked in tomato sauce on top of the stove, but with the addition of bell peppers, for example, and often topped with feta. Um, 
comes from a slightly different area of the world. But there are a lot of different applications where you're poaching eggs in sauce, which is essentially what we'll be doing today. Um, of course, you could have it for breakfast or for lunch as well. So let me get these onions going. And also, once they're done, I'm going to add a little bit of garlic. Um, this would be a great use for uh, if you've canned tomatoes or if you've frozen tomatoes from your CSA shares this summer. Um, this is going to be a really nice use for that too and something a little bit different than spaghetti sauce, for example, or tomato soup, even though those would be also really great uses for um, a large amount of tomatoes that you might have. Has anyone tried eggs in purgatory before or shakshuka? Like I see some people shaking their heads. All right, so maybe this is new to you. You'll see that it comes together really, really quickly. Um, my onions are starting to saute. So this recipe calls for half a yellow onion, two cloves of garlic, um, and you're gonna saute those again together in olive oil to bring out the, um, the aromatic flavors of those ingredients. Folks who love goat cheese. Yes. It's delicious and it's a favorite fast meal. It is such a quick meal to make. You're seeing those onions are just starting to soften and you just want to do the garlic for about 30 seconds or so until it becomes fragrant. And I've got um, some crushed tomatoes that I'm going to add and you add those just until they become slightly thickened in the pan. <laughs> so generally when things are becoming a little bit thicker, you're going to do that on a simmer rather than a medium high. So this is going to be more of a medium, medium low. And once that comes up to temperature, then you're going to start adding eggs. So one technique to do if you want to be careful about adding eggs on camera, which Tanya reminded me of, um, is to break each um, egg into a ramekin first before you add it into your pan. Um, that way, if you get any shell in, which I actually just did a little bit, um, or if the egg yolk breaks at all, um, or if there's anything else kind of weird going on in that egg, um, then it's not going to go into your finished dish. Um, the eggs that I'm using today are also local. They're from Elmwood Stock Farm, which is in Scott County. So maybe some people know Elmwood Stock Farm. They're one of the larger um, certified organic farms in this area. I'm going to go on and I think I'm going to add two eggs because I'm pretty sure this is going to be that much. <laughs> we actually serve eggs in purgatory for one of our first party breakfasts. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, with a rosemary focaccia is a nice combo. Yeah, having a little bit of bread with this um, is really nice. Um, you could do any kind. Focaccia is delicious. Maybe some pita, uh, maybe some French bread or baguette. Um, all of that would be really good. And some folks are saying that they like to eat this with goat cheese. Um, sometimes you see it with feta. Today I'm going to do it with uh, some grated Parmesan, which I'm going to add at the very end once the eggs are cooked. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like when I've added the eggs. You can see that right now they're just kind of hanging out there in that sauce. But over time, the whites are going to cook in the sauce and it's going to firm up. And you can sort of do it to kind of however you like your eggs. Yeah. Um, some people may not want the yolks um, intact. So if you feel like you are one of those people, then you can certainly break the yolk as it's cooking um, and it will help enrich the sauce. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not having this over bread, you could have it over rice, you could have it over pasta, you could have it over farro or any other farro. Grain. Yeah, farro, if you're not familiar, is a whole grain. It's a wheat product. It looks kind of like a wheat berry. And you can actually, speaking of Trader Joe's, find um, 
heart cooked farro in the dry goods aisle that only takes 10 minutes to cook. So that would be another great thing to build up. That's a great, great for making a quick dinner too, because yes. otherwise you have to soak farro overnight. <laughs> and that requires planning ahead, which who has time for that anymore? <laughs> I know. So my whites are beginning to set up a little bit. I'm going to go on and add a little bit of chili. I just picked these this morning. So these are from my house. Um, not a local farm, although right now is pepper season. There are so many beautiful chili and bell peppers of all colors and shapes and sizes at your local farmer's market. So if you are a pepper fan, you like to stuff them or preserve them or just use them in lots of ingredients like or lots of recipes rather like chili like Tammy is going to be showing you in just a minute. Um, now is your pepper time. Anyone have any questions while this is going? Let's see. I'm just going to show you here. You can see how those whites are setting up in the hot sauce. And if you wanted to, you could also cover this and that would help steam the eggs as well. Um, some people will also finish a dish like this with the oven too. Right. Let's see. Just I'm just going to show you what I'm doing on the stove and I'm going to go on and clean up a little bit to make room for her section of the demo. So now that those are just about done, I'll show you what it looks like here. I'm going to go on and cut a little bit of basil. You can also top this with any green herb um, that you'd like. Maybe some fresh parsley or rosemary would be nice. But you'll see I just did a really quick chop on that basil. Add it my dish and I'm pretty excited to eat that for lunch. <laughs> so you saw how I literally made that in real time. Okay, so you can see how quickly that is. And you can um, alter the recipe depending on how many people you're feeding by just adding more eggs to a bigger pan. All right, I'm gonna do a little bit of cleanup here. See if there's any questions or comments. Again, we will send you these recipes after we get everything public. Okay. And we'll switch out real quick here. What I'm going to show you is very quick as well. Uh, so we were looking at different ways to use the pantry and one thing that I have done successfully here uh, at the Food Connection Kitchen is to uh, do a little potato bar. It's a great way for one to use up some things that are in your pantry or in your fridge or in your share for that week. It's also um, pretty inexpensive. You've got the potato base. Uh, today we're going to be using sweet potatoes. Uh, you'll start to see these in your boxes if you have a CSA share. Um, I just baked these in the oven. Uh, no frills kind of technique, just wash them, threw them in a 400 degree oven. I don't poke them when I put them in. I let them steam for about 20 minutes, flip them, and then poke a hole in to let the steam escape. And depending on the size, it usually takes about 15 or 20 minutes more. 
Now to our uh, potato, sweet potato bar, we're going to add a few things. I'm going to start off with something else you probably have a ton of or are seeing a ton of. I have greens in here. We have some local collards and some local arugula. These are from uh, over the bridge in Frank. Blaine County, I do believe we have some shrooms from Prayer Mountain. Uh, I'm sure you're seeing lots of different vendors at the farmer's markets on this. I have some of Adrian's onions. Uh, and then I've got a little ricotta and a little Kenny Mattingly's uh, peppercorn Asiago right here. So I'm going to get a saute pan on and uh, put a little olive oil in there. And it blew it up. All right, so we're gonna on heating. Just got a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. Gonna coat the bottom of the pan and maybe a little bit of the stove. <laughs> um, and basically, I'm going to start off with my onions and my shrooms and get those going in the pan. Uh, once those have kind of cooked down, given off their water, it'll take about four minutes or so. Um, actually, I'll add the garlic in as well uh, at the end of that. And then we toss the greens on and we're just gonna wilt those down. Uh, so that's pretty basic. And if you want, I'll show you what I'm doing over here. I'm gonna spin you around. I don't have a lot of cutting to do either. So we'll get these onions on. We're getting, we're getting a nice sizzle. And then I've already chopped up, I've just taken the mushrooms. These are oysters, but you could use whatever your favorites are. Just give them a little wash. If you like shiitakes, you just want to make sure to remove those tough, tough stems and then chop up the uh, shrimp. Because we're going to make a little mixture here. You could probably slice them. Um, any, we're looking at a mixture that's going to fit on top of our sweet potato and kind of fill it like a stuffing, uh, but we also want it to, to fit on a fork too. That's always awkward when you're trying to eat and you get a big chunk of mushroom. Those mushrooms look so good. They are delicious and they're, uh, they're beautiful. Um, Ashmore Farms also has some gourd. They do the full range of the oysters, the pink, the, that oh, beautiful tawny gray, yes. the, the buttercup yellow. You can find those at the as well. I'm not sure if it's Ashley Farms, but it's another vendor that has some really beautiful variety. Yes, yes. So we have quite a few mushroom vendors, yeah. local mushroom vendors now. It's really exciting. Um, I've got some here on the We'll see. All right, so I'm just sauteing them down and I'm getting the water off. So I'm going to add in garlic. This is about two to three cloves of garlic. And that's just going to take one more minute. I want to talk to you. You might be wondering why my ricotta is all wrapped up, <laughs> bandaged up here. Uh, it's not in, it's not hurt or anything, but I did want to strain some, a little bit more of the water off of it. You, just like we like strained yogurt because it makes it extra thick and creamy. That's the same thing I'm going for here with the ricotta. So I just put it in some cheesecloth uh, and uh, let it drip for about an hour. Nothing big. Uh, you can let it go overnight in the fridge if you want to. I did leave it in the fridge. And then I'm going to mix that in with all of this. Uh, and then add a little cheese on top. Uh, so I'm going to probably add my greens a little at a time. Now I'm going to add quite a few greens for this tiny little saute pan, but they will wilt down. And you're adding collard and arugula. Collards and arugula, yes. Uh, you could use anything that you have on hand, chard, uh, spinach, uh, kale, especially, um, this is even good you can, when you're cutting it up into these little bitty ribbons, it's even good for some of your more mature greens, which we might be seeing now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll notice that as the weather gets colder, the greens will just get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Um, I, I love winter greens. Uh, 
treats. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, they're delicious. All of the, the energy from the sun goes into the, making maybe a little bit of a, a smaller leaf, but a, a sweeter green. We do have a question from Vicki asking if we can freeze mushrooms because hers always ruin before she can use them all. Um, I think you can, I tell you what I do a lot of times with mushrooms, and you probably do this too. Uh, I will chop them up really small and make what's called a duck cell sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, you add a little thyme, a little shallot, or red onion would be fine. Uh, and so you're, you're chopping it up, and it's what's typically put on beef wellington. Uh, but it's this wonderful, and then you kind of grind them up a little bit. Uh, and the fat that you use to cook them, and you've cooked the water out, so they, they preserve really well. Otherwise, I prefer to dry mushrooms, yeah. and that way you can rehydrate them and use them again. Yeah. So those are two ends of the preservation spectrum on, on mushrooms. Yeah, there's a lot of water in mushrooms naturally, and when you freeze it and those ice crystals form, it can kind of destroy the integrity of the mushroom, and it'll just make it dizzy. Okay, I'm going to bring you back around here. Don't mean to make you dizzy. Uh, but I've sauteed down, and now you'll notice I have just barely wilted my greens. And I'm going to set that down and stir in my ricotta. I love ricotta. Ricotta sometimes gets forgotten as a good protein source as well. A lot of people might think of cottage cheese, but don't snooze on ricotta. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite pizza toppings. I don't know if y'all oh, have ever yeah. tried that, but it's divine. It's delicious. You can also, if you wanted, put a little grate of nutmeg in here, something out of your spice cabinet. Um, and really, you could use whatever mixture of veggies you wanted. This is one of my favorites, though, mushrooms and greens with some red onion. Uh, and then we're going to add a little bit of this cheese right here. And then we're going to let that sit and melt just for a moment. I will plate up all of the potatoes at once. Uh, secondly, we're going to throw on a chili very quickly. I'll spin you around. I've got everything here. Let me see if I can get you right up in that pot. And I've just got a couple of cans of beans here. Again, just some white onion, garlic. I've got some corn that we preserved early in the summer. I'll be honest with you, I can't remember which farm it's from. <laughs> uh, I've also got some of those lovely local bell peppers and we have some gorgeous nardellos. If you've never had a nardello, it is thin flesh. It's, it's a bullhorn shape, very long skinny one. It's like between a bullhorn and a cayenne looking. They're not spicy, but they have super great fruity flavor. Uh, I love nardello peppers. And uh, then just some tomatoes. These come from UK's on South Farm. Gorgeous end of season tomatoes that are wonderful for sauce. So I have made them into a little bit of tomato sauce. And then a couple kinds of beans, just directly out of the can here. I have washed them. Uh, I do like to rinse anything that is canned to get rid of any excess sodium, because I like controlling what salt goes in my food. All right, so we're going to put a little bit of olive oil in the bottom of the pan. The onion, peppers, and again, say you'll notice a pattern. I'm going to let that saute just for a minute before adding my garlic. And I've kind of done the same thing that Vanessa has done too. We have a magic of TV version of this. So I'm going to stir those up. Let them saute for a minute, throw in my garlic. And I would normally let that saute for another minute, but we're getting close here. So I wanna make sure we have time for your questions. Uh, once I saute that for about four or five minutes, I would add some of my tomato products. A bit of the tomato products. I will send you a recipe <laughs> um, of these proportions. And now today I've got just some pintos and some kidneys. You could use black beans. You could use cannellini if you wanted. You could use chickpeas. Uh, if, I, if I go a little off of sort of your traditional Southwest flavors, I tend to go North African, uh, maybe some Moroccan spices rather than what I'm going to use today, which is 
your traditional cumin, coriander, chili pepper, cayenne mix. Um, I often put in a little smoked paprika because I can't use enough of that stuff. <laughs> uh, and then, um, but actually I'll add a little bit more tomato sauce to the ratio of beans I've got here. I like a thick, chunky chili, but you could add enough liquid to thin it out, especially if you're someone who likes adding pasta to their chili. So actually, we'll do this. We're gonna make a big pot. Okay. We're gonna be eating well. Very hearty. <laughs> now that it's turning cold, we, right. we, we obviously are affected by the weather. So adding no corn, and this is, you could use frozen. Uh, I would I would advocate more for frozen just for flavor and texture preservation, but if you have canned corn and that's what you have on hand, this that works perfectly too. This is something I just like to add. If I weren't putting it on sweet potatoes, I'd probably add some kind of fall squash to my chili. I love it, it gives it density and a little bit of sweetness. Butternut, acorn, delicata. Uh, any and of them, <laughs> kabocha. It's nice and dense and spicy. All right, and then what I would do is I'm gonna add my spices. Uh, so a little bit of coriander, quite a bit of cumin. I love that smoky, earthy flavor, so that's probably closer to a teaspoon and about a half a teaspoon of the coriander. And then this is a chili powder. It's kind of a hot chili powder, so I am, I'm only gonna put about half a teaspoon of that. And then of course we're going to salt and uh, let that simmer for probably normally about 30 minutes or so and come all together. But I'm going to leave that on just for now and I'm heating up another batch. And if we've got time, I think we do. I'm going to show you one last one. This is your bonus. Uh, this is for Dr. Greg because we're going to use Oh, but there are the yellow peas, uh, and um, this is sort of a Mediterranean salad. The one thing I am going to show you on the board, and I'll, I'll mix this up together on the board so we won't have to spin you around anymore, no dizziness. Uh, the one thing I am going to chop up, I have everything else ready, is some preserved lemon. And I wanted to show you this. This is something I keep in stocked in my pantry. and. Uh, Whenever I juice a lot of lemons, I think, oh, it feels like such a waste. You can actually use those peels and preserve them. This is a typical uh, Mediterranean, North African kind of process where you can take the skins uh, and you can either salt cure them. And that's the, that's the traditional, traditional way. way. Uh, these have been blanched and brine cured because I wanted to try something different. This is so, I've never, done preserved lemons this way. So that uh, I'm learning something new here today. So and I just keep a jar of these. They are salty, so you have to be careful. So you're just doing tiny, tiny amounts. But let me tell you, if you like grain salads, seafood, um, any mixtures of any kind, <laughs> the bound salads, I put these in chicken and tuna and anything else. That sounds good. Great. Uh, it just, it just you could add it to salad dressing, maybe. Salad dressings would be awesome. It is this, you can smell, I don't know if you can smell it. Oh, the yeah. aroma is um, just fresh lemon everywhere. Uh, and um, it's just a pop of brightness in everything. Turn these chilies down. And then we add the peas or the chickpeas, whichever you have. I'm going a little bit Mediterranean here. I have a little bit of diced red onion. Well, those little bitty ones, there are some greens in there too. And a little uh, olive. You could use whichever ones you like. Again, another great pantry item to have around. Some chopped red pepper. And you do this in whatever amounts you want. I will probably send amounts, but make it however you like it. One of my favorite pantry items to have. Ah, uh, yes. Splurge on these. I really do, because a little goes a long way. Are sun-dried tomatoes. Do you like them better in oil or not in oil? I like both, because yeah. sometimes I want that oil. Mm -hmm. That oil is nice just for salads, just yep. to drizzle on. I've got a few capers here. Love the briny stuff. And then I do have just a little drizzle of olive oil. If I had uh, sun-dried tomatoes in oil, we would just be using that. And then just a tiny bit of 
Vinegar, whatever, again, a great pantry item. People don't use acid enough, <laughs> I don't think. Absolutely. And we're just gonna toss this together and make, and this is great just on its own, just this sort of Mediterranean salad. Now, I don't wanna forget my pinch of preserved lemon and a good pinch of pepper. All right, so let's bring those potatoes up here. So we'll start with our greens. And you might think that these are, you're like, oh gosh, I don't know about that with a pepper or with a potato, but just experiment and start with things you do know you like. And um, I do this with the students a lot to show them that there's more to putting on sweet potatoes than cinnamon honey butter, <laughs> uh, which is the, about, about the only way you can get them to eat a sweet potato. So there's our greens. I'm going to put just a sprinkle of cheese on top, and then you can throw that back under the broiler. Uh, and we will do the chili. And I didn't get myself. Yep, I left myself about a spoon. So we've got our chili here, and this would be great on a last night got chili. So chili is good for chili nights, and uh, we'll just put that in there. Uh, we could also use if we thickened up Vanessa's lentil soup. That would be wonderful. It so, really would. Yep. With that curry flavor. There's that, and I have just a smidge of fresh cilantro as well with the stems. Again, I say the same thing. I'm like, you don't want the stems on this. The only herb you want stems on is cilantro. Exactly. So don't leave those out. And then lastly, let's do our Mediterranean pea salad. Inspired by Dr. Gray. Inspired by Dr. Gray. Loves chickpeas. And you get lots of protein, lots of fiber. Uh, you can incorporate whatever veg you've got at the time. And yeah, that's a good point too, Tanya. I want to say that whenever you are eating with nutrition in mind or with health in mind, the more that you can combine your nutrients together, it's just going to make you more satisfied. It's going to help keep your blood sugar more steady. And it's just going to be an overall more enjoyable experience. So with your sweet potatoes, you've got a fantastic complex carbohydrate. We've got lots of different options for protein here, like cheese, like um, two kinds of cheeses. We've got the beans that are in the chili. We've got the garbanzos that are in the Mediterranean salad. And you're combining that with a little bit of fat too from your cheeses, from your oils, um, from your olives. So these are absolutely complete plates that are going to bring a lot of deliciousness to your meal. And this is great going into fall. So anything, if you're getting a CSA share and you're like, well, I have all this cabbage, make a slaw and throw it on top. Really and truly, you could throw, I, I can't think of many things I wouldn't put on top of a, <laughs> a sweet potato. Yeah, and it's something like you said in the beginning, you can cook in advance and then have lots of different topping options throughout mm -hmm. the week. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or comments? Yes. We are monitoring the chat. Dr. Greg is very excited about the chickpeas. <laughs> and like we said earlier, we will be sending out the recipes, a recording of this demo, and the list of um, our suggestions for building your pantry. Um, we've got that list divided up um, with the, we've got two lists actually. We've got a food list and an equipment list. So the food list is divided up into things like canned and jarred items, starches and dry goods, condiments, refrigerator and freezer, etc., as well as some extras to zhuzh up your pantry a little bit. And then the equipment list has the same, some basic building your kitchen ideas as well as a list to add to that basic list when you are able to. So we'll be sending all of those materials out to you uh, by the end of the day today. Gail cannot wait to get the recipes. We're excited to send them. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome to Rebecca and Lita. Thank you very much. Delora, thank you. <laughs>
Uh, one other thing I would like to mention as far as like building up your pantry, and I know some people are very concerned about spices. You know, I don't want to buy it if they're expensive. I don't want to buy it if I'm not going to use it again. Uh, so one of my strategies is I don't get a lot of spice blends. I don't purchase a lot of pre-made spice blends, but what I do is I make my own. So if you like uh, a blackening spice or like a Cajun Creole kind of thing, especially a lot of those have a lot of sodium. They really and, do. And I, I, it's, I hate getting my dish finished and then going, oh, I can't add that because of all the salt that's in it. So I like making my own. And that way, most of them are spices you can use in a lot of other things. Uh, so, you know, like today we've used cumin, coriander, chili powder, cayenne. Uh, I've got a garam masala here. It has just a little bit of cinnamon and coriander uh, and um, cardamom and things like that in it. Uh, I have a berry berry seasoning here. That's just chili, a lot of different types of chili powders and a little bit of coriander, um, maybe some um, allspice in here too. Uh, one of my favorite spice blends is sattar. Mm -hmm. You can put this on roasted vegetables and like a bowl, like flatbreads. Um, I've even seen a turkey, I was a tar roasted turkey. <laughs> so um, this is a blend of um, sumac, oregano, thyme, some sesame seeds. These are things, uh, I use sumac a lot. I, I, I pretty much any time I make hummus, uh, it has sumac on it. But uh, so anything, uh, think about blends. Uh, and don't just worry about getting that one spice. Um, and also another way to use spices and not have a huge container of them uh, is to buy in bulk. Karen is saying she'd be up for a spice blend workshop. Oh, that would That's be great so idea. much fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've done something similar with uh, sauces mm -hmm. around the world, but yes. maybe we need to do spice blends around the world. Yeah. yeah, I did something like that many, many years ago at Wellness. Um, I think the recipes are on the Wellness blog somewhere. <laughs> we might, we might, might have, have to revisit that. that <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Let's see. Vicky saying she loves sweet potatoes and usually eats them plain, except with a little cinnamon and nutmeg. So this is an interesting twist. Ditto to the spice blend workshop. Okay, great. Right. Great. We gotta get that rolling. Yeah, we will. Any other questions or comments? And to, I want to assume sumac is one of those spices that Tanya just mentioned, and it might be a little bit unusual to some folks who are here with us today. It brings kind of a lemony, almost puckery factor. Mm -hmm. um, so taste-wise, it's fantastic, but also color-wise, it's beautiful. It's like this rich maroon color. It's very deep. Yes, yeah, and um, it, it's good on all kinds of things like dips, mm -hmm. chicken, fish, Anything roasted kind vegetables. of rich. Yes. It's a, it's a, again, it's where I love those little tiny uh, pinpoints of brightness in, yes. in the dish, especially if it's kind of heavy, that something kind of acidic and lemony is, is a perfect foil. Yeah, it's fantastic. Keeps your palate interested. Yes. All right. What about the sumac from a tree? It's a bush. It's a bush. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's from the berries. Yes. I don't want to tell you wrong, but I think it's from the, I it think is. it's ground dried sumac berries. That's yes. true. Yes. Not the same as poison sumac, but uh, those are white. We're not so. going out on a hike. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but, but there is some sumac that does grow here in Kentucky and in this area of the country. And it is a similar sumac berry to the one that we use for spice. The one that grows here in Kentucky, you can actually pick those berries, dry them, and grind them and make like a lemonade type beverage. Oh, kind of like spice bush. Yes. Oh, lovely. I love yes. spice bush. So it is similar. So all kinds of foraging to add to I know, the pantry. Mushrooms, <laughs> sumac, sure. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? We've still got quite a lot of people with us, so thanks for sticking with us till the end of our demo today. This demo is the first in a series of three. We are going to have another one on October 4th. Is that right? October 4th. That will also be a Zoom demo, and registration for that will open up on the UK Wellness Dashboard two weeks before the class start. So keep an eye out for that. What's our topic gonna be on October? Our topic is improvisation. Yes, uh, cook once. Or cook once, eat twice. twice. Oh gosh. No, We've got too many ideas. <laughs> yeah, we do, we have so many. Um, but do keep an, an eye out for our, our October 4th demo and then we'll also be bringing you one in November. In person. In 
person here in the Food Connection kitchen. So registration for that will not open up until later in the year. It'll open up in about the second week of November or so. All right. Well, you all have stuck with us to the very end. Thank yes, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Anyone has any questions or comments that they weren't able to get into the chat, you can always email um, either myself, vanessa.oliver, epy.edu, or tanya, tanya.lighthouse at epy.edu, and we are happy to help. Um, and see, reminders going out. Yes, signing. so what we can do is for everyone who has registered for this class, we can um, create a mailing list and sign, send out reminders for when this is the next month's open up. So thank Excellent. you for that note. All right, you all have a wonderful right. day. Thank you so Bye -bye. much.